Lord, uh, in a word of prayer, but listen to the words of Jesus. I'm just going to pick out one phrase, one verse to read to you, but Jesus is ministering uh, to a man, and of course, there's always a crowd wherever Jesus goes, but he's ministering, and he's, he, he says this in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 19, verse number 26. It says, Jesus looked at them and said, with man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. So this morning as we go into a word of prayer, as we end that prayer, we'll jump into worship and just give God glory and praise. But what is your thing this morning that seems impossible? What is it that maybe you've struggled with this week or, or, or whatever it might be, but you just kind of walked in today with this thing? It may, it may not even be on the forefront of your mind, but it's your impossible thing. Today I want you to know that with God, all things are possible. And it doesn't matter what your thing is, but with God it's possible. So, Father, we give you thanks and praise today that you're a God that has no limits, has no bounds, has nothing that will constrain you, but you are limitless. You are all powerful, all knowledgeable. And so, Father, we just give you thanks, we give you praise, we give you glory and honor, and we recognize that with man it is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Be pleased, Lord, as we worship you, as we lift up your mighty name today, and we pray all these things in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. amen. Let's worship him this morning. Hallelujah. Just one word, you calm the storm that surrounds me. And just one word, the darkness has to retreat. And just one touch, I feel the presence of heaven. And just one touch. My eyes were open to see, my heart can't help but believe. There's nothing that our God can do, there's not a mountain that He can move. Oh, praise the name that makes a way, there's nothing that our God can do. And just one word, you hear what's broken inside me. Just one word, and you revive every dream. And just one touch, I feel the power of heaven. Just one touch, my eyes were open to see. My heart can't help but believe. There's nothing that our God can do. There's not a mountain.
right now says, I will believe. Come on, church. I will believe for greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise. Let all agree. There's no power like the power of Jesus. I will believe. Come on, church. For greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise. Let all agree. There's no power like the power of Jesus. I will believe. For greater things. There's no power like the power of Jesus. Let faith arise, let all agree, there's no power like his power, there's nothing that our God can't do, there's not a mountain that he can't move, oh praise the name that makes a way, there's nothing that our God can't do, oh there's nothing that our God can't do, there's not a prison wall he can't break. worship you this morning because we know there's nothing you can't do. Holy Spirit, we need you this morning. Minister to every heart. You, you know the different paths that we walk. You know the different things that have happened, things that maybe we're not looking forward to this week because of maybe what our calendar, or our schedule says, but Lord, we know there's a God. Hallelujah. And so this morning, would you come? Holy Spirit, would you rest on us this morning? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. As the Spirit was moving over the water, Spirit, come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us. As the Spirit was moving over the water, Spirit, come move over us. Come rest on us. Come rest on us.
without you. We can't do life without you. We can't breathe without you. We can't make decisions without you. We can't raise our kids without you. We can't be a light in a dark world without you. We can't do anything without you, God. We 
we need you this morning. We need you. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, Father, we worship you this morning. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. here for a moment and just worship him. Tell him how much you love him. Tell him how much you need him. Tell him how much you can't do this without him. I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest, and without you, I fall apart, you're the one that guides my heart. I need you, oh, I need you. Every hour I need you, my one defense, my righteousness, oh, God, how I need you. Lord, I come. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest, and without you, I fall apart, you're the one that guides me. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour I need you. My one defense, my righteousness. Oh, God, how I need you. We're sick. Deep, your grace is more where grace is found.
I need you more, more than yesterday, I need you more, more than words can say, I need you more than ever before, I need you more, I need you church. Tell them how much you need them. Tell them how much you love them. One more time before we transition. God, we just love you so much. We need you, Jesus. We need you, Jesus. We need you, Jesus. Thank you that you're just a prayer. We can call upon your name. Every minute and every hour. Father, we worship you this morning because you're worthy of our praise and glory and of our honor. God, you're worthy of it all, and we're just so thankful that we have the privilege of gathering together, where it's, whether it's in person or online, just to worship you because of who you are. Father, forgive us for the times where we feel like we need something else more than we need you. Forgive us of those times where we put other things in front of you deeming them more important in the moment. Father, forgive us because we need you and we need you alone because you are a source of life. You are a giver of every good and perfect gift. That's what your word says. And so, Father, we just, we recognize that this morning and stand in awe of who you are. We worship you. We thank you. We praise you. And we do it all today in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. Give the Lord a clap offering. Take a moment and greet someone who's near you this morning. Say hello to them. Let them know that you're glad to see them. Good morning to all of our online viewers and those who are here joining us online, whether you're uh, joining us live or joining us later down the road. We're so excited and thankful that you're here. We're going to take a quick moment at uh, this time in our service. And Zach, if you could switch microphones. Uh, we're going to do one more. Dismiss our kids. So, if I could have the board, if I could have my wife come forward, uh, I also need Ron and I need Wendy and I need Kayla to all come up front for just a moment. And uh, we just want to give a moment. How many know the Bible says, Give honor where honor is due? Amen. Anybody ever read that before? 
Okay, both of you. That's, that's good. I'm just teasing. No, we want to take a moment because today's, a, today's an incredible day at LifeSpring. And uh, I'm going to ask you to stand over there with her. And I'm going to ask you guys to come over. Unrehearse completely. You see that? Uh, that's the way we like it here at LifeSpring. No, I'm just teasing. I want to take a moment and just say a thank you uh, to a couple of folks. And we're excited. You know, God's moving in our midst. Amen. Amen. I hope you know that. I hope that you sense it. I hope you realize it. But God is moving. And so I want to let you know just some transitional things that are happening here at LifeSpring. So back at the beginning of the year, we needed a men's ministry director. We needed somebody who could lead the men. And I was doing it, but, you know, I I don't need to be the one that does it all. And so I was just really praying, Lord, raise up somebody. And so we had a men's ministry meeting, and it was me and Ron that showed up that one night. And I'm like, okay, I don't know. No, but we got to talking, and we got to praying. And it was just a few weeks later that Ron said, hey, pastor, I feel like God is calling me to lead the men's ministry. And uh, so Ron has transitioned in to lead the men's ministry. And in doing that, the Lord has told, uh, has, he's felt like the Lord's told him, I need you to lay something down so that you can pick something up. And so he's picked up the men's ministry, but he's unable to lead the greeters right now in that team. And so, but we want to take a moment and honor Ron for eight years of leading our gr- greeter ministry. And so we want to give the Lord a clap offering, but Ron and Arlie as well. And so we just have a little, a little something here for, for you and for Arlie uh, in doing that. And we just appreciate your kindness and your faithfulness. And it's not over. <laughs> There's a little something in there too. Yes, sir. Um, but anyway, it's not over. But we're just excited as you transition from one ministry into the next. So thank you for being obedient to the Lord. And thank you for just allowing him to direct your steps. And I know that God does that. Another conversation that I had at the beginning of the year was with Wendy. And Wendy said to me, Pastor, I think this is the year that I'm going to retire. And I said, well, I don't accept that in Jesus' name. And uh, she said, well, no, (laughs) no. But lightheartedly, I said that, obviously. But God's doing and working and moving in her uh, life as well. And so we're excited for that transition. She's not transitioning out of life spring. Uh, She's going to stay right here. So a matter of fact, she's got a, a, a little double thing moving on. So she is transitioning out of her church admin position. Um, she is officially done with the admin part of it. She's going to continue to do church finances for a few weeks in, in another transition, but then she'll be stepped out of that position and retired, but she is stepping into leading the greeter ministry. And uh, so we're excited about that. Yes, that's wonderful. And so, um, but Wendy, we want to take a moment and honor you for, for is it eight or ten years? I, I keep... It's eight years of faithfully serving in this church admin position. And there's been a lot of ups and there's been some downs. And, uh, you know, there's been some tough spots and some really bright and shiny spots. I, I remember a time where it was, we weren't here very long and Wendy came into my office and she said, I could tell she was viv- visibly upset. If you know Wendy, you know she doesn't hide that emotion very well. And that's not a bad thing. But I said, what's wrong? And she says, I don't think I can do this anymore. And at that time, I knew it wasn't time to joke. So I said, well, tell me about that. And so she just shared her heart. And I said, well, what if we just pray a little longer and let's do this together? Let's sit down and take a look at what you're doing. Maybe there's some things, you know, we could get rid of, somebody else could do. And to make a long story short, she's been serving faithfully. For, we've been here six years, and uh, she's been serving faithfully for the last six years. And I know before the pastors before us as well. Wendy, thank you. From the bottom of our heart, thank you for what you do. Thank you for all that you've done. And again, it's not over. God's transitioning you into, Wendy is not leaving life spring. I can't, you know, I just want to articulate that enough for us. But, uh, but we're excited to announce that Kayla is transitioning in to be our church admin. And so we're really excited about that. And so she hits the ground running today. Uh, today is when she's really going to get off and started. So we're just really excited for what God's doing. And, you know, I, I, I often refer to in leadership about leadership team is a bus, but sometimes God asks us to change seats on the bus. He's not asking anybody to get off the bus. He's not kicking anybody off the bus, but he's saying, hey, in this season, I want you to sit in a different seat. 
And so I'm really excited for that. So Ron, we're excited as you lead lead men's ministry. Guys, uh, Ron just has a great heart for men and what it looks like to be a godly man and a husband and a father. And so if you haven't been coming to men's ministry meetings, we invite you to do that. Our next men's ministry meeting is two weeks from today. Uh, It's usually it's the third Sunday, but there's a scheduling conflict. So guys, our next men's ministry meeting is two weeks from today, four o'clock in the afternoon. We would just really love for you to come and be a part of that. Wendy, we're excited to see what God's going to do through you and our greeter ministry. I know you, that is just an area of ministry that you're passionate about. And I don't know that I've ever seen, in the six years that we've been here, I've ever seen Wendy without a smile. And so we're just really excited for what God's going to do. And Kayla, you as well. I'm just really excited as you transition. Uh, just pray for Kayla. She's going to need an extra dose of something to work alongside of me. Uh, that is no easy task, but uh, we're just, in all seriousness, we're excited for what God's doing in your heart and your life and your uh, and, and you and your marriage and all of that. So we just stretch a, for, a hand forth towards these folks, and we just want to pray over them. Uh, Father, thank you for today. Thank you for what you're doing at LifeSpring. We thank you for the exciting things that are happening and taking place. And so, Lord, we give you the honor and the glory because you're worthy. And Lord, Ron needs you as he serves in men's ministry. Wendy needs you as she serves as our, our greeter uh, ministry, and Kayla as she transitions out as, into our church admin. So, Father, we just ask your blessing to rest upon them, encourage them, strengthen them, and Lord, we'll give you thanks and praise for it. In Jesus' name we pray, and everybody said, amen. 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 Give the Lord one more clap offering. You all may be seated. Thank you. We're going to go ahead and dismiss our kids for Kids Church at this time. Pre-K through sixth grade, you are dismissed We do have a couple of other quick announcements, and while I make them, maybe you can take out your Bible and turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew, and we're going to be in chapter number seven today. Matthew is the first book of the New Testament. The New Testament is the second half of your Bible. First book is Matthew chapter number seven. Wild Water Adventure starts tomorrow at 6 o'clock. We are super excited uh, for what God is going to do. And for those of you that have signed up to be a part of that, we are going to meet for a few minutes after church today right here in the front. We're just going to gather here just to go over some last-minute details, answer any questions that you might have, things of that nature. So Pastor Crystal is going to lead that meeting time right here after service. We'll give you a few minutes to socialize or say hello or whatever, but then we're going to gather right here. There are uh, 70 postcards in the back that still need given out. Each postcard represents a little boy or a little girl that needs to hear Jesus. I don't say that for guilt. I say that because that's the reality. We live a lot alongside of people and they need Jesus. Amen? Amen. And so I encourage you, I urge you, uh, take several of these, two, three, four, five, and invite somebody. Uh, We're running three days, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, right at Lidditz Spring Park. We're going to be in the Hanley Pavilion, which is in the back of the park, closer to... uh, the high school, and we're going to be there from 6 to 8 each night. If you have not signed up to help, but you would still like to help, then join us for the meeting that's happening after church today. It's not too late. Um, We just want to come and, like I said, touch base on a few things. A couple of other things very quickly. We are having a Life Kids Ministry meeting next Sunday after church. For all of you who are currently serving in our kids ministry, that's in our toddler class, our pre-K class, our elementary class. If you're a teacher, if you're a helper, uh, you help once a month or you help every Sunday, no matter what position it is, we're inviting you to stay for that meeting. If you're sitting here saying, well, I'd kind of be interested in hearing some more about kids ministry, then we want to invite you to that as well. Lunch will be served, and so we just want you to come out and be a part of that. Ladies, not this coming Tuesday, but next Tuesday is our women's ministry meeting. Men, as I mentioned, two weeks from today uh, is our men's ministry meeting. And then here's an announcement that there's no slide for, but I want you to write it down. Take out your phone or if you have a pen. We're having another pig roast this year, and we're super excited about that. And that pig roast is happening on Sunday evening, September 18th at 5 o'clock. 
Sunday evening, September 18th at 5 o'clock. And we'll talk about that some more as we get a little bit closer. But now that that date is confirmed, I want to give it to you. Uh, Sunday, September 18th at 5 o'clock is going to be our annual pig roast. Uh, we had a blast last year. It was just a great time together. And so we're expecting another great time again this year. Whew, there's a lot going on at Life Spring, and I hate to, to t- stop and take all those, or make all those announcements, but we need you to be aware of what's happening and what's going on. We don't want you to be in the dark or be like, hey, I didn't know we were doing that. And uh, so make sure that you're following us. There's a calendar that's hanging in between the double doors. There's a paper copy of that calendar on the information table, and our calendar is available on our website. So there's no reason. So uh, make sure you, you check out those things. Today, we're going to continue our Under the Hood series. And we're taking a look at our five core values. They're hanging on the walls to your immediate left or right. And uh, those five core values at LifeSpring are being biblically centered, being passionate in our worship, welcoming culture, community-minded, and being committed to excellence. Two, two weeks ago, we talked about being biblically centered. We talked about what it means to have a biblical worldview. Last Sunday, we talked about living a life that's a, a, a lifestyle of passionate worship. And uh, where every word and thought and action is an la- act of love to the Lord. And I just want to pause for two seconds. If you missed either one of those messages, go to our Facebook page, our YouTube channel. Go online to our website and check them out. Just great reminders for who God has really called us to be. One of the things I love about the core values at LifeSpring is it's not just distinctive to life spring, but really these are things that you and I as believers should be living every day of our life. You should be biblically centered in every area of your life, not just your church life. You should be passionate about Jesus and what you think and how you act and what you say, not just when you're greeting a brother and sister in the Lord, but when you're walking the halls at school or you're around the water cooler or you're representing him in the doctor's office. Like We should be living a life that's passionately worshiping Jesus every day of our lives. Today, though, I want to talk about being community-minded. For those of you that are very big on following the order, I'm going out of order. Biblically-centered, passionate worship, but today we're going to be talking about being community-minded. Here's what I mean when I say community-minded. Reaching beyond the walls to those near and far with the compassionate love of Christ. Reaching beyond the walls to those near and far with the compassionate love of Christ. And I want to pause before we jump into Matthew chapter number 7 because something struck me this morning as I was reading that thing that I just read to you. Reaching beyond the walls to those near and far with the compassionate love of Christ. It's not just reaching beyond the church walls, but it's reaching beyond the walls of your home. It's reaching beyond the walls of your school, like it's not just one area that God has called you and I to reach, but it's reaching beyond ourselves to those near and far with the compassionate love of Christ. While Jesus was on earth, he gave this, made this statement in Matthew chapter number 7, verses 13 and 14. This is in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. It begins in Matthew 5, and it goes the way all the way through the end of chapter number 7. But here in chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, he gives this instruction. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. I remember the first time that I read that scripture, not in terms of context, was it in a sermon or was it in a small, I, I, but I remember the first time hearing that verse of scripture thinking, what path am I on? Am I on the broad path or am I on the narrow path? And it caused me to do for a, for a moment, maybe it was a couple seconds, maybe it was a couple minutes, but it made me do an evaluation. Which path am I traveling? I know which path I would like to be traveling, 
I know which path the scripture says I should be traveling, but when it gets down to itself, what path am I traveling? Remember we said two weeks ago, talking about living a biblical life style, uh, uh, being biblically centered, that your actions will prove what you believe and how you live. Not just the words that we speak, but the actions will line up as well. Because if you read the Word, if you pray to God, if you allow that to come in, eventually what goes in comes out. Amen? That's practical advice on all levels. What you feed yourself eventually has to come out. If you're going to fill yourself up with Jesus, then he's going to begin to overflow. If you're going to fill yourself, fill, you fill yourself up with filth, eventually it will overflow as well. So choose the right thing to fill yourself up with. When we, take this, when we step back a, a step and we look at that verse of Scripture, enter through the narrow gate, that's the statement, and then Jesus makes the comparison, wide is the gate and broad is the road, and then small is the gate and narrow the road. He is not just talking about ourselves, but He's talking about mankind, painting us a picture. Many will find the broad road with the wide gate. Many will find that. Few, comparatively, will find the one with the narrow gate and the narrow road. But I believe as believers, you and I are called not just to make it to heaven, but to take some folks with us. Yes, we need to get to heaven. But once we ask Christ into our life to be our Lord and Savior, to forgive us of our sins, He's then commissioned us, not just to put it, as I like to say, in Christian cruise control and just kind of coast through, but to be very intentional with how we live our life so that He will spill out in every area, not just your church area. Not just when you're coming to church or going to a life group or men's ministry or women's ministry or youth group or kids. Not just then, but Jesus will spill out in every aspect of your life. You say, well, that's kind of hard to do. Well, listen, in Luke chapter number 10, in verse number 19, Jesus has commissioned 72 followers to go out and do the work that he's commissioned them to do. And they're going two by two, and he's told them how to do it and where to go. And if people respond this way, this is what you do. And if they do it a different way, this is how you respond. And when they come back, they're all excited. They're like, "Woo! the demons even trembled when we were praying. And they should be excited about that. And Jesus responds, he says, because I've given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy, nothing will harm you. Nothing that the enemy does can harm you. Why? Because you're bought with the blood of Jesus Christ. Because you're a son and a daughter of the Most High God. Now, I've heard people preach this and say, oh, I've given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions, and so they take their liberty at the word, and they think that they can do all sorts of crazy things. I tend to believe, and we can discuss this later if you'd like to, I don't think Jesus was saying, go play in the snake pit. I think because Jesus sent 72 out on the highways and the byways, the snakes and the scorpions were more contextual for the folks he was talking to, but he continues saying that he's given us the power to be able to do what he's commissioned us to do and to overcome all the power of the enemy, nothing will harm you. And then he encourages those believers in the next verse, verse 20, and he says, by the way, don't rejoice in the spirits that's submitted to you, but rejoice that your names are written down in heaven. 
Yes, we want more, Lord. We want more. I want to talk to my neighbors. I want to see them, you know, get saved. I want to do all those things. I want to be able to lay my hands on people and watch them be healed and delivered and all of those things. But Jesus says, listen, when it comes down to them, rejoice that your name's written in the Lamb's book of life. Rejoice that your name is written in heaven. And you and I ought to get excited about that, that Jesus says to get excited that your names, rejoice that your names are written in heaven. And in that, you and I ought to start to get a little bubbly on the inside. I don't mean like the Holy Ghost goosebumps, but something ought to bubble up and stir on the inside. If Jesus says, rejoice that your name's written in heaven, then maybe I want to help somebody else rejoice when their name is written in heaven. I don't know if you've ever seen the production of uh, Heaven's Gates and Hell's Flames. And I know they change that periodically to update it and things like that. I saw that production a number of years ago and there was a little thing right in the middle uh, and, and it was a, a skit, if you will. It was a little, and, and there was two people and they, they both died. I don't know if it was a car accident or what it was. Uh, but in the one, they go into heaven and you know they stand in front of the gate and they oh your name is written well done good and faithful servant enter in and the other person uh, stands there and says uh, depart from me I knew you not and I don't know the accuracy of this next part but I'll, and I'll explain in a second I don't know the accuracy of this next part but I'll tell you when you watched it in that moment it was pretty powerful and as the angels come and they lead that person then who they said uh, depart from me I knew you not they that person begins to scream you knew you knew? Why didn't you tell me? And that's what you hear as they're pulled off stage, symbolizing being separated from God for all of eternity. It's a powerful moment when you think about it. baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And what? Surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Maybe you've been to a seminar, you've been to a, a class, you've been to something, and at some point the, the, the person who's delivering the message will say, and if you take nothing else from this seminar today, from this class today, if you, then I want you to hear me now. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You've heard that before? A couple of you. If, you. if you hear nothing else today, I believe that was one of these moments with Jesus. Because he's just speaking to the 11 who followed him. He's not speaking to a large crowd. If you read the scripture in context, he's speaking to 11 men. Those were, of course, there were 12 apostles and Judas Iscariot hung himself and now there's 11. He, he knows the audience that he's talking to. And he says, go into the world. If you've heard nothing else that I've spoken to you, if you don't remember any miracle that I performed, if you don't remember going out two by two and healing and, and praying, if, if you don't, just remember this last thing. Go into all the world. Making disciples, baptizing, teaching the things that I've commanded you. Oh, and by the way, I'm not going to allow you to do it by yourself. I will be with you always. God's not asking us to do anything that he's not giving us the power and the authority to do alongside of him. He's not your cheerleader. He's your helper, your counselor, your comforter. Yes, I'm describing the Holy Spirit because Jesus said when he left, he was sending the Holy Spirit. And that's why it was so imperative that he, come, that he left so that the Holy Spirit could come 
to be community-minded, therefore go and make disciples of all nations. Jesus said, I've given you the authority to overcome all the power of the enemy and remember that wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction. In Luke's account of this last encounter, excuse me, uh, in Acts chapter number one, verse number eight, Jesus says, but you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And then in verse number nine, after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. Jesus is gone at that point. He's up in heaven, which is where he still is today, alive, seated at the right hand of the Father, ever interceding for you and I. And now we look at a church, a group of people left without the physical presence of Jesus. No longer was he on earth any longer. And we transition into the book of Acts, chapter number 2. We see the Holy Spirit is poured out on the church. Ten days after Jesus ascends, the Holy Spirit descends on those gathered in the upper room, 120. As we look at Acts chapter 3 through 5, we see the church is born and it begins to grow. And thousands are being added to their number. Number. Thousands are being added to their number. In chapter number six, there's so much growth of the church that the apostles recognize they can't do it all. We, there's too much to do. There's people to take care of. There's needs to be met. And so I, I'm flying through this. So if you've never read these portions, you can take some time and do it this week. But in, in chapter number six, then they raise up, they choose seven that the Holy Spirit kind of illuminates to them that are going to help facilitate not only church growth, but taking care of these people who are coming to faith. And in chapter number seven, we see their, our first martyr. We see Stephen, who is one of those seven who was chosen, who is arrested, has to stand before all of the religious leaders, and ultimately is stoned to death. Listen, these are, the, these are the events. This is the birth of the modern day church in Acts chapter number one through chapter number seven that I just summarized. That's the birth of the church. It's our history. And that church that was birthed then, right there in Acts chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, is the same church. It's the same movement that started right there. Stephen is dying uh, his last breath, and of course he's interceding for those who have stoned him. Boy, that's a lesson in a sermon for us right there, but I'm not going to get off on, on that tangent. But in chapter number 8, something powerful happens, and that's where I want to pause for a few more minutes before we stop. In the book of Acts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, chapter number 8, beginning in verse number 1, on that day, let me tell you what that day is real quickly. On the day Stephen was stoned, just because if you're just reading verse number one, you, don't, you might not know. You've got to read it in context. And we know that on that day, meaning on the day that Stephen was stoned, a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. A great persecution broke out. Why? Because these religious leaders made this example of Stephen, and they stoned him. Stephen had a, a pure heart. He was God. The Holy Spirit had raised him up to, to be a help, to, to assist the church, the believers, to do the work of the ministry that needed to be done for all of these people, to meet their needs and to feed them and to clothe them. All of the things that the uh, apostles, the early church, were responsible for doing, and Stephen was leading the way. And who arrests him but the religious leaders? The religious leaders. And you can read all about it in chapter number 7, but Stephen basically gives a summation of everything, of, 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 of history of religion, if you will. The history of Christianity, all the way from the Old Testament, all the way through who Jesus was. And he gives this whole summation, and, and, and in the end, he's killed. 
praying for his persecutors, praying for the ones who stoned him, but he's killed. And so now there's like mayhem everywhere. Are they going to do that to me? And so it says everybody but the apostles are scattered. They all leave. They're gone. They go. Verse number two says, some godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him, but Saul, Saul was a leading religious leader. He's later known as the Apostle Paul, by the way, if you're unfamiliar, but in this point he's Saul, and he was giving permission for Stephen's death, but it says, Saul began to destroy the church going from house to house. He dragged off men and women and put them in prison. Quick side note, if God can do that in Saul's heart and make him one of the leading evangelists and missionaries, then God can do that in your heart too. There is nobody beyond the grip and grace of Jesus. If you're sitting here today saying, yeah, well, I've shared, you know, Jesus with my neighbor or my spouse or my whoever it is, they are not a lost They are not beyond what Jesus can do. You've heard the verse of Scripture that says, With man it is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Do you know that that verse of Scripture is actually referencing and talking about salvation? We use it in a plethora of other ways, and let's be honest, it's true. There's nothing impossible with God, but that verse of Scripture is in reference to salvation. With man, it's impossible. You can twist, you can pry, you can poke, you can preach, you can pray, you can do everything that you want, and you, it will be impossible for you to get them converted. It will be possible for you to get them into heaven. But with God, anything is possible. Any heart is able to be surrendered to Jesus when God is in the mix. And we read in verse number four, those who had been scattered. So pause for a second. We go back to verse number one. Why were they scattered? Because Stephen was stoned. Saul began to persecute those who believed, and they all left except the apostles. That's what it says. They all scattered except the apostles, and they began to go. And then we go back to verse, those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Fleeing for their life. Because some he had thrown in prison, some he had killed. Saul did. Fleeing for their life, they still did what? Tell somebody else about who Jesus is. Now that's backwards thinking in my human brain. Hello? Anybody? Or is it just me? In my human processing... This sounds like anti-religious. I understand that. In my human processing, if we're not careful, it's like the whole fight or flight, right? We got to go. Pack it up. We got to get out of here. We could be next. I could be the next Stephen. You could be the next Stephen. The neighbor could be the next Stephen. We got to go. Grab what you can grab, kids, and we're out. And let's just get as far as we can go before we stop. That, that's what, to me, would seem like a natural response, but here are some people that lived with Jesus, that walked with Jesus, that talked with Jesus, whose eyes were opened because of Jesus, their ears were open. Maybe they didn't walk with Jesus, but now they can, and they saw the miraculous power, and there was just something inside of them that compelled them to talk. Hey, listen, we're headed. Hey, where's everybody going? Here, walk with me. Let me tell you about Jesus. And in the midst of this uncertainty, in the midst of this persecution, in the midst, let's be honest, of possible loss of life, they still thought to tell somebody about who Jesus was. Why? Because their life had been transformed. Their life had been transformed. They watched the blind eye open. It might have been their deaf ear that was open. Like they saw it firsthand. 
They didn't walk down the road and, and see Will sitting there and be like, have this inner debate. I wonder, should I stop and tell Will about Jesus? Should I, just, should I take out two minutes and do that? You know what? Somebody else will. Lord, just, just send somebody else Will's way and keep on going, right? We do that, don't we? You don't have to admit it out loud, but I know you do. So do I. It's, it, we do it. God, forgive us. And I mean that wholeheartedly. God, forgive us. And and here's why I say that, because as you read that verse portion of Scripture, you might think to yourself, well, listen, they had Jesus like right there, right? They lived with Jesus. So it was easier for them to tell other people about Jesus than it is for me, because, you know, nobody in my workplace knows about Jesus. They certainly aren't going to church. So, you know, the circumstances are a little bit different, Pastor. I see the, the, the connection you're making, but listen, that's a lie from the pit of hell. Because you live with Jesus every day. And you have seen his transformational power in your life every day day. Some of you have been healed of sickness and disease. Some of you have had a deaf ear and it's been open. So we could just go around and you could shout out your ailments that the Lord has healed. Some of you had heart problems and they've been healed. Some of you had hip problems and you don't limp any longer. Some of you had serious like medical things that have been proven and they're not an issue any longer. Don't tell me It was easier for them when you've got a resurrected Christ, the Holy Spirit living inside of you. It's easier for them. Baloney. We don't want to step out in the power and the authority that Jesus has given us to do the work he's called us to do. Brothers and sisters, your friends, your co-workers, and your family are going to hell. That's the reality. I've got family members headed to hell. I've got neighbors that they breathe their last breath today are not going to be in the presence of Jesus. God has called us. God has commissioned us. God has empowered us to do what he's asked us to do. Go. Listen, he's not asking, I don't think, he's not asking you to pack up and head to overseas or a third world country. He's saying, go to your neighbor. Go to your coworker. Go next door. Go across the street. He's not asking us to sell everything we have and become missionaries to third world countries. He's saying just be a neighbor to your neighbor. Be a friend to your friend. Love those around you the way I love them. See, when we start putting those scriptures into practice, boy, the weight of that begins to settle. You say, well, how do I do that? You know what one of the beautiful things is, as we take a look at core values, and I mentioned earlier in the service, it's really not just core values of life spring, but really founding God's word for us. When I decide to be biblically centered in everything that I do, when the Bible is the authoritative word, authoritative word in my life, when I allow my life to become an active, excuse me, when I allow my life to become a passionate act of worship with my thoughts and my actions and my words, then telling people about Jesus is easy.
It means to announce a good tiding, especially when related to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Preach the good news. Give a good tiding. Don't be afraid and ashamed to bring Jesus into a conversation. Don't be afraid and ashamed to tell somebody you went to church. Don't be afraid or ashamed to offer to pray for someone. Listen, the world needs hope. The world needs peace, both of which Jesus offers abundantly. And you experience His hope and His peace. Some of you have had some storms lately and can testify to the hope and peace that have come in the midst of the storm. And listen, in, in, in all love and respect, He didn't just do it to you, give those things to you because of how great you are. He offers it to anybody who needs it. But you and I have neighbors and co-workers and family members that are all, they're out searching for hope and peace in all the wrong places. Things that might feel like they have hope or peace, but it's just for a moment. It's just for a, a second and then it's gone. But you and I know Jesus Christ, He offers peace like the world can't offer. There's hope in Jesus Christ far beyond the situation that you're in. It stretches all the way through eternity. And we, who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory, are being transformed into His likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. I'm going to read that one more time. And we, who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory, are being transformed into His likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. We talk about transforming lives one heart at a time. When you ask Christ into your life, He transform you, transforms you, but there's still this process of being transformed. And Paul writes about it right here in this scripture to the church. Now, to understand what he means by unveiled faces, we have to go back and read a little bit earlier in that chapter. But basically, those that don't know Christ have a veil. They're not, under, they, they're not able to understand and comprehend all the things of the Lord. But when we call upon his name, that veil is removed. And we're standing face to face with our Savior. So he says... And we who have unveiled faces, that means he's talking to the believers, he's talking to the church, all reflect the Lord's glory. We're being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory. Would you stand with me? Think about that first scripture that I read this morning, Matthew 7. Wide is the gate, broad is the road. Narrow is the gate, small is the road. I think as believers, 
It's our job to not just make it to heaven, but take as many folks with us as we can. Does the Lord want to build His church? Absolutely. But can I be honest with you? I think the Lord is more concerned about building His kingdom than about life spring or grace or trinity or any of those others. He wants to see His kingdom grow. You know, go to a football game and the stadium's divided in half. You've got the home team and all of its fans and you've got the visiting team and their fans. There's, there's not going to be denominational sections in heaven. Hey, all the Pentecostals, you sit over there. Hey, all the Methodists, you're going to be over there. He just wants to see his kingdom expand. He wants to be able to save as many Any that will call upon his name for salvation. Remember, Peter writes, uh, God's not slack concerning his promise. And I'm going to paraphrase the next part. But he's holding off so that more people can come to know who he is. Oh, Jesus is coming back, church. And he's coming back for a church without spot or wrinkle. That's what he says. A church that is, has their heart set towards him. That love him with an undying, everlasting love. As much as we humans can love, that's who he's looking for when he's coming back because he says he's coming back, but he's holding off just a little while longer so that more people can know who he is. And that's where we come in. Go into the world and tell others about who he is. Go into the world and make sure your friends and your family and your coworkers know that Jesus is Lord of all. And sometimes we think, well, we got to tell Jesus to the poor people or the homeless people or the people without a job. Listen, every single person needs Jesus. Even the ones that live in the big house or the fancy cars or the high-paying jobs because they're just as hopeless as someone who's very different than they are. We have a tendency to think it's just those who are without that need Jesus, but every single person person needs Jesus. The rich, the poor, the young, and the old, and and every other classification that you can come up with. And it's our job. We've been commissioned. We've been empowered. Now it's time to start to do it. Father, today as we gathered in your name, We've sang those songs, there's nothing you can't do. Holy Spirit, would you come and rest upon us? God, we need you, we need you, we need you. And every one of those songs is so, so valuable and true. But Lord, as we close this service, each one of us are going. We're leaving these walls We might be headed home, we might be headed to a birthday party, to a restaurant, or any myriad of places that we can go, but we're going. So would you help us to represent, and not just represent with how we live our life, but the things that we think and the words that we speak. Father, would you help to us to catch a burden, to have a burden for the passion for those who don't know you to rise and increase within us, Lord, that we might tell somebody who you are. Or maybe they'll bring up that they were scared or they had no hope or they didn't understand and that would be a beautiful transition into sharing Jesus with them. That you would just show us very clearly that open door to be able to, to minister the gospel of Jesus to them through that situation that they brought up. Lord, would you help us? Would you equip us? Would you show us? Would you empower us? Lord, your word says that you already have. So would you help us to recognize that anointing and empowerment that you've already given us? It's our job to share and leave the results up to you. Father, help us this week to Take the opportunity to tell someone or two or three. We lift up our wild water adventure that's coming and starting tomorrow night. Lord, there's going to be a great opportunity to have conversation 
with some parents who drop off their kids. Great opportunity to minister the gospel. Not because we want them to come to church, because we want them to know you, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Oh, God, we love you. Holy Spirit, we need you. Help us to reach beyond the walls, the walls of our church, the walls of our home, the walls of our cubicle at work. Help us to reach beyond the walls and share the compassionate love of Christ with others. Father, we thank you and we praise you. We give you glory and honor because you're worthy. Now, Father, as we leave this place today, go before us, lead, guide, and direct us in all that we do and all that we say. Help us to be a blessing to others and give us the boldness that we need to gracefully share the gospel of Jesus Christ with others. Lord, we'll thank you, we'll praise you, we'll give you glory and honor for it, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Give the Lord a clap offering this morning. He's worthy. For those of you that are sticking around, there's a wild water adventure meeting. That'll take place in a few moments. Take some time and greet others. Thank you for your giving. There's giving envelopes in front of you as well, and you can take that and put your tither offering in there. And then finally is our postcards. Take some postcards. Invite some kids in the neighborhood or the community where you live. God bless you. Thanks for being here today, and you are dismissed.